Hello and welcome everyone to today's big issue debate on central banks. What should a 21st century central bank look like? A very timely question as the global economy and financial system continue to face uncharted waters moving further ahead into the 21st century. As we all know, central banks around the world have similar responsibilities to ensure economic and financial stability, both of which are crucial for economic growth, stable money, and sound financial infrastructures. Yet central banks today are being challenged to extend their roles beyond their traditional mandates and to respond to increasingly complex and rapidly evolving trends that have far reaching impact. Some argue that their plates have already become so full they struggle to do their day jobs, which is challenging enough. The 08 financial crisis and global pandemic have strained monetary policy tools and debates about QE, tapering, inflationary pressures, the labor market and financial stability already overwhelm their agendas. Still, pressure to address new problems has, addressed, has added an urgency to the issue of expanding central bank mandates and in some instances, their independence in the face of mounting political pressures. The ongoing pandemic and challenges affecting economic growth, such as climate change, sustainable finance, income inequality, and financial inclusiveness are forcing central banks to rethink the full range of their responsibilities. At the same time, technological innovation and growth of digital finance with greater participation by big tech and fintech are forcing more rapid modernization of financial services and infrastructure. They have upended traditional norms and disrupted the banking system, all of which questions the adequacy of existing regulatory frameworks. The accelerating debate around digital currencies and the future of money, including cryptocurrencies, has become equally ubiquitous. Many central banks have undertaken initiatives to engage in these developments from working with fintechs and innovation centers, such as the Boston Fed and MIT, exploring technology for a digital dollar in the US to the launch of domestic digital currencies in the Bahamas and China. The rapid emergence of cryptocurrencies has also required the attention of monetary and market regulators. And on the international stage, efforts for greater collaboration have intensified, such as the G20-led initiative for enhancing cross-border payments and integration efforts across a range of multilateral groups, the Financial Stability Board, the Committee for Market Payment Infrastructure, the BIS, the World Bank Group, and IMF, and along with the global banking community, all of which has added greater public sector, private sector dialogue. So what should a 21st century bank look like? To discuss this, we will look at the issue of expanding central bank mandates, both within national borders and across borders, as well as the impact of innovation in digital finance. We are pleased to welcome a distinguished panel of speakers today, two central bank institutions from Asia and Europe, Howard Lee, Deputy Chief Executive from the Hong Kong Monetary Authority, and Ulrich Benzel, Director General, Market Infrastructures and Payments at the ECB, and a leading global commercial bank, HSBC, with George L. Hedery, co-CEO for Global Banking and Markets. I'm Patricia Haas Cleveland, U.S. President of the Official Monetary and Financial Institutions, OMFIF. Welcome, gentlemen. So to set the stage, let's start with a very simple but key question. Can a central bank today achieve its objectives while operating within its traditional mandates of monetary and financial stability? Ulrich, to you, would you say yes or no? And if no, what do you see as the top drivers challenging this? Yeah, thank you, Patricia, for having me in this uh, most interesting panel and for allowing me to, to open the discussion with that uh, question. And I don't want to speak for all central banks, of course, because they may have uh, different uh, mandates and therefore different challenges or not to um, address, let's say, additional demands. and. Uh, just for the case of the ECB, the objective is enshrined in its Article 2. And there was some flexibility put there uh, in 1994 to the ECB because it says, uh, okay, objective is to maintain price stability, but without prejudice to this objective, it shall support the general economic policies in the community with a view to contributing to the achievements of the objectives of the community. 
So, and, and moreover, it shall generally act in accordance to the principle of an open market economy, favoring an efficient allocation of resources. That's also quite a, quite a broad uh, mandate. Um, in addition, then there's an article talking about the three tasks of uh, the euro system, of which one is to promote the smooth operation of payment systems, which uh, certainly in the context of cybers is a very relevant point and is the basis for the euro system providing infrastructures, providing payment systems, acting as a catalyst in this field and uh, being overseer and a standard setter via international fora like the CPMI. And they're also working, for, for example, on the cross-border uh, payments uh, agenda. So I believe for the euro system, at least there's no need to revisit the mandate. Um, of course, that is not an answer then exactly to which fields of the community, of the objectives of the community, the European community, you all want to add in practice. Not everything may be suitable, but uh, but I believe there is uh, enough room to uh, conclude that um, objectives, economic and society objectives, in, like uh, inclusiveness or climate change, uh, can be covered. Uh, by by the mandate and uh, and of course it's a matter of, of deciding by the governing council is it compatible or does it even support the monetary policy objectives and is it um, let's say close enough to the activities of the ECB to be suitable as a supportive policy towards uh, the communities. The last word is on the on CBDC. So do you you find a sufficient reference to the issues of CBDC in the mandates and of course in the case of the ECB in 1994 CBDC was not uh, at the horizon so that is currently being discussed between lawyers of the commission and the ECB whether there's a need you know for some additional legislation to uh, make the ECB able to issue CBDC. Thank you, Ulrich. It sounds like you've, you've got the ground covered, uh, given your original mandate to have sufficient flexibility with it. Um, George, from HSBC's perspective, what drivers have you observed that could challenge the traditional central bank mandate in, in terms of what's going on in the world today and the pressures they're seeing? Thank you, Patricia, and, and thank you for having me here today. Um, we've, we've put in some thoughts in terms of general challenges to traditional mandates of central banks. Some would be applicable to some and not others and vice versa. Um, and I'll, I'll go through some of these thoughts. And, you know, we, we, we split them into seven categories in no particular order, but hang on with me a little bit and I'll, I'll try to speak through them. So the first one, and this is, you know, uh, building on what Ulrich was saying, climate change and how to incorporate climate objectives or other climate considerations, including basic climate taxonomy, etc into central bank mandates uh, to address the financial stability risks, um, in particular for transition risk and you know, for physical risk. Um, the second challenge we face, again, this one is building on what Ulrich was saying, is the digital currency scope. So on the one end of the spectrum, you have CBDCs, which is central bank kind of led initiatives. On the other end of the spectrum, you have the DeFi or decentralized finance, a totally, as yet today, unregulated space where anonymous cryptocurrencies, among other things, thrive. And how do we lead the transition to an ecosystem which allows innovation, but at the same time is stable and safe, both domestically and cross-border, is a challenge central banks are going to have to face. The third challenge uh, we see in that space is the exit from quantitative easing. You know, effectively, how can we avoid unintended consequences of market disruption and navigate the uncertainty around price stability in this space? Obviously, we're all familiar with the taper tantrum. Um, how, how will it look like this time around and what the implications will be for you know, asset prices in general and the economy? The fourth consideration, um, which is uh, um, um, obviously more subjective, but important to, to put forward is central bank independence. Um, there are a number of challenges that central banks are facing. How can they ensure they respond to these challenges 
within the context of providing price and financial stability, which is their mandate, while remaining free from undue political influence and mission creep, if you want. Um, something that we would be watching carefully across you know, all the economies and all the jurisdictions where they operate. Um, the fifth consideration um, we will be that we believe will be challenging central banks going forward is income inequality. Now, obviously, this is very much a political slash economic debate, but inevitably central banks um, will be asked to opine or even play an active role. Um, some of these inequalities may have been an unintended consequence of loose monetary policy. And, you know, ho however much these policies may have exacerbated the inequality, how can we resolve them? Um, the sixth challenge um, that we see today facing central banks is the overall financial stability concerns, specifically in the current context where they have been growing in many parts of the world, for instance, either due to high house prices, and you know we've seen some of the most recent events uh, in China, uh, but also high levels of household and or corporate sector indebtedness. Again, um, something that we've observed in a number of uh, economies. So the, the question really is whether central banks need to play a more active role in addressing these issues and how could they you know, help support um, you know, uh, measures towards this role. And the last one I wanted to highlight, um, uh, Patricia, is the, um, well, ba basically, probably back to the same old traditional inflation. The problem is for the last 20 years, technological improvements, uh, but also demographics, specifically in the Western world, but also supply chains have meant that there has been a continuous downward pressure on inflation. Inflation was never a concern. Obviously, the absence of inflation has grown to be a concern over the last 20 years. Obviously now we're seeing some supply shocks. Uh, we're seeing one-off spikes in prices, some of whom are you know, thought to be um, you know, transient or temporary in nature, some of which may be you know, more permanent in nature. And therefore the question is, you know, are, are we well equipped um, to be able to deal with um, what's going to come ahead in inflation? Um, and, um, and are we able to adjust policies from, if you want, a lethargic 20 years of inflation to address what now we've seen sprints above 5% uh, on consumer price inflation. So I think I'm, I'm, I'm summarized here some of the challenges, you know, that, you know, in no particular order, again, Patricia, I'll insist um, that we think central banks of today will may have to juggle with alongside their traditional methods. Thank you. That, that was a, a great sort of broad look at what's going on out there. And it definitely leads into the question of looking at the traditional uh, mandate that we have and, and the external pressures and trying to figure out, do we have sufficient tools in our toolkit? But, uh, but thank you very much for that. Let's go back to you, Ulrich. Um, the ECB recently published in July its new monetary policy strategy. So as you're looking at your own um, strategy and sort of within the traditional bounds of, of your mandate, what do you see or do you see some newer challenges uh, looking ahead in your own strategy? And, and if so, how are you thinking about addressing those? The strategy review was uh, mainly focused on on the very core business of uh, the monetary policy mandate, although it then uh, added, for example, climate change as, a, as another important topic to be worked out further. There were not, uh, let's say, full um, full answers yet in how to operationalize the uh, considerations on climate change, for example, in the collateral framework of a central bank, although a reference to this uh, being done uh, is already there in the outcome of the strategy review. But let me say just uh, one or two words on the, um, on the monetary policy strategy outcome in a narrow sense. So that um, one, George referred to the challenges in the coming years of uh, policy normalization. And, and exactly that's what we have. We have uh, not uh, strictly normal policy, and we had that now for 10 or 15 years. And therefore, it was uh, quite natural to ask, uh, what have we learned from those uh, persisting episodes of uh, heavy use of non-standard measures? 
And I think here the long-term trend has really been the one starting in, in 1982 of uh, a tendency of inflation pressures to be weaker gradually and uh, relating to several factors like an increasing credibility of central banks as inflation fighter and uh, uh, the structural decline of the real interest rate, which itself uh, seems to be due to lower growth rates, aging society, etc., which has accelerated in particular in the last years. And those, in addition, let's say, to the major shocks we have seen, this has uh, led uh, together to this, uh, let's say, repeated hitting of the zero lower bound to interest rates, which has then also led to the necessity to deploy all those non-standard measures. And the non-standard measures may have some side effects. Um, they are more complex than if you would only have to deploy interest rate policies. So it's natural to look at the very core of the formulation of the inflation objective. And here the ECB has done some uh, important adjustments, the symmetry of the inflation target um, and the, let's say, details of, uh, of the way this is to be achieved over time. I think those are very important measures necessary to, um, to reflect, you know, what we have really learned over the last decades and uh, giving the ability of the ECB in the future to everything else being unchanged, have uh, less episodes of, uh, of non-standard measures also, which seems, uh, of course, uh, desirable. Of course, now the world seems to have uh, changed a bit. We have those supply shortages. So some would say uh, the, um, the, all this, uh, let's say, worry about deflationary pressures is not on the very top now of mind of people. But as our policymakers have repeatedly stressed, there's a belief still that those uh, shocks will be temporary. And we are not necessarily now in a different world than the one of the last 15 years where we had those repeated more deflationary shocks. Great, thank you. Um, Howard, let's go to you in the Hong Kong Monetary Authority. Um, if we look at some of the traditional roles that we have in our mandate, like supervision, um, what do you see as some of the challenges with these traditional roles? And especially, I know that you have done in response to digitalization, taken a lot of initiatives. Uh, you recently announced your FinTech 2025 strategy in June. What can you tell us about some of the things that you're doing both on your traditional mandate, but also in a very forward looking way in light of the rapidly digitization of the world? Okay, thank you, Patricia. And now, uh, George has uh, really covered the ground very well on the number of challenges faced by central banks and indeed the financial sector going forward. And like in many places in Asia, um, the financing is pretty much uh, bank centric. So um, really need to ensure that banks are also rising up to meet these challenges. Say, for example, in terms of a uh, green uh, financing, um, we, 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 we work very closely with the bank to make sure that in their operation, in their sort of own, uh, own book, uh, they would uh, be able to contribute to the process of uh, contributing to ESG and also uh, support the need for more green financing. And in terms of policy framework, in terms of the capability, so we work very closely uh, with bank on this. Uh, arguably, this is not really the traditional sort of prudential supervision, but more a, a capacity enhancement for the industry as a whole. So these are the things that we have been uh, doing in consultation, uh, in, it's called in collaboration with the banking industry. Specifically on your question about um, digitalization, uh, we uh, fully see that uh, digitalization more generally uh, is going to be something of a huge challenge uh, to both banks and also uh, supervisors uh, in the sense that you see more demand for digitized service, uh, more demand for automated service, AI assisted advice, all, all these. Uh, that means banks would be employing these technologies. Um, they would need the know-how, they need the funding, they need the support, uh, technical support to do all these. And on the side of the supervisors, we also need to up our skills. Uh, to make sure that we understand how to supervise them and how to we 
uh, sort of a define the responsibility of bank officials as compared to a, say, for example, an AI algorithm uh, when they make decisions and how do we draw the line? These are new things that we all need to sort of look further as to how best to strike a balance about encouraging innovation, but at the same time, uh, ensuring potential supervision, supervision and also overall financial stability of the uh, banking sector. And, um, and um, even for some apparently uh, pretty um, uh, innocuous uh, operation like uh, moving from internal system to cloud system, uh, it might sound uh, pretty natural for all industry, but when you talk about a major bank having most of its core banking system or data uh, entrusted to core provider, and then you have many systemically important banks entrusting the same service to the, the to do the same service provider, uh, whether we are creating another kind of systemic risk uh, for the financial sector as a whole, uh, there's no easy answer to these questions. And again, um, uh, this is not something that uh, we should uh, put a brick on, uh, but we need to think through how best we can manage the risk uh, going forward. So these are risks that uh, probably uh, did not happen, did not, was not there uh, 10 years ago. Um, we also talk about uh, digitalization generally, and also we announced a FinTech uh, 2025 blueprint um, in June this year. Uh, uh, this is precisely um, the reason why we want to have a more comprehensive blueprint uh, for the development of tech and FinTech for the banking sector as a whole. Through this, we actually look at the whole ecosystem uh, in Hong Kong for supporting uh, the uh, escalation of the digitalization of banks generally in Hong Kong. There are different types of banks. There are more sophisticated banks. They are already very, uh, very much uh, digitized and they have full capability to do it on their own. But they are all also smaller banks which might need a little bit more help. Uh, that's why we draw a blueprint looking at a whole host of issues, uh, including how we sort of uh, uh, assess the baseline assessment of the technical competence of banks, what kind of help they would need uh, in terms in terms of uh, both policy and also tax skills. We also look at talents, we look at funding support, policy support, uh, and also um, 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 different areas of um, work. Uh, we also look at the financial infrastructure, in particular data infrastructure, infrastructure that we would need to put in place to help banks do better on, 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 on digitalization. This is something uh, that I can elaborate a little bit uh, more later on. Uh, my last thing to put in this is that it's not just we are asking bank to be more digitalized. Uh, we in the HMA uh, uh, also need to do a lot of this. We, we are doing a pretty comprehensive digitalization uh, program on our own, both in terms of the way we collect regulatory data from banks, as well as how we use these structured data and unstructured data for the purposes of supervision as well as for our sort of a macro surveillance and uh, macroeconomic analysis. So these are very exciting opportunities that we are uh, working on. Uh, we're happy to uh, elaborate on the, some of these um, uh, initiatives uh, later on. That's great, Howard. I think you really uh, captured some of the two most critical things a lot of central banks are thinking about in this new world of digitalization, it's not so new anymore, but certainly the challenges crop up each day. And that is, how do you how do you encourage innovation and at the same time uh, protect and promote financial stability um, in in terms of uh, in terms of these developments? And also, how do you think through the risk associated with the transition to this digital economy? So, thank you very much for that. Um, Let's go back to George, uh, to one of the points that you mentioned. As we look at some of these external pressures that maybe we weren't anticipating uh, 10, 20 years ago, even though it was creeping up on the horizon, what are some of the things that you think, um, when people talk about so-called mission creep, you, you refer to this, but as banks, uh, both uh, central banks and commercial banks think about these challenges, um, 
how you're handling them. I know your CEO recently in an interview spoke quite a bit about sustainability and how you're looking at that and how you're thinking about that. Um, what role, for instance, do you see central banks playing in this case of, say, sustainability and the complicated issues associated with that? Okay. Um, thank you, Patricia. So if I, if I start addressing the first point of your questions, of your question first, the, um, so, so we're indeed um, a global bank. And when kind of when we say global, we are present in, um, you know, more than 55 countries on the ground. We have entities that are regulated, um, you know, in all these countries and that serve different type of clients, you know, from, you know, public sector institutional corporates all the way to retail in many of those cases. And if you look at our client base, most of our client base is global in nature. Certainly, you know, corporate clients and institutional clients, you know, all discussions we've been having with our corporate clients is that they continue to intend to have global supply chain. Maybe they're looking at diversification of previous supply chains, but they're still looking at global supply chains, maybe sometimes regional, but still cross country. Um, they're still looking at global um, kind of uh, markets for their products and services to distribute into. And if you look at institutional clients, the same still holds true. All our institutional clients still have global aspirations for investment. So when you, when you look at it this way, we are still a global bank serving global corporates and global institutional clients. The biggest challenge therefore we face today is the risk of fragmentation of the various jurisdictions in which uh, we operate. Um, so we, we will have therefore to respond and react differently to different, if you want, central bank policies or other regulatory policies in each of the jurisdictions we operate in. Um, you know, we, we, we see these challenges um, as a bank, you know, uh, you know, across whatever different requirements there may be, different reporting standards, even under IFRS 9, we have different reporting standards. Uh, different priorities that our regulators have been asking us and that certainly puts a challenge if you want for us to be able to play the two roles of you know fully in compliance with the local rules and, and regulations in each ju ju jurisdiction we operate with for ourselves and our clients and we serve them uh, for that but at the same time having to fragment ourselves to be able to deal with that now on the positive side that um, global presence and in particular in in, in developing markets is giving us the opportunity to work with local policymakers and local regulators to help shape uh, their response and, and their strategies. And, and, and also from an operational perspective, another good news is the um, is obviously the global institutions such as FATF, um, you know, the Basel Committee, the, SF, the FSB, etc., who are enable us to put in place global processes, you know, while being responsive in, in local circumstances. Now, as to the second point of your question about sustainability and climate change in particular, they can have different implications when it comes to central bank mandates and, and central bank objectives uh, <clears throat> around the financial stability and price stability, if you want um, uh, considerations. So the first one is, um, how will climate risk considerations be factored in uh, quantitative easing or reserve management considerations. Obviously, this is something um, you know the ECB has been speaking about. A number of other institutions, such as Bank of England, have been speaking about, and it's for us, therefore, to assess what the implications will be, um, you know, um, you know, on, on the back of reserve management quantitative easing by central bank on climate considerations. Um, the second matter, um, you know, again, vis-a-vis um, -vis, uh, climate changes, central banks are today playing a crucial role in helping set standards, define taxonomies, um, and, and therefore that role is very helpful in making sure that we kind of all align behind um, ideally one, but certainly many fewer taxonomies and, and kind of you know, avoid a fragmentation where we then run the risk of greenwashing because of lack of clear guidance in terms of you know, what could be deemed as ESG compliant or climate uh, you know, climate change, climate, et cetera, and, and whatnot. Um, there is also another role which central banks uh, in this space are playing an active role on, and this is the stress testing and capital treatment uh, of green assets and non-green assets. And here it's a, it's a two-edged sword in a sense. Obviously, two lax 
a treatment of capital for you know non green asset and and the you know and, and we are on the risk of not transitioning fast enough but there is also the other side where too strict uh, treatment of non green assets or certain non green assets will run um, the risk of you know either kind of pushing the financing of these activities into shadow banking or dark places in an unregulated space which nobody wants or possibly will run the risk that they find themselves out of um, you know out of funding too soon and you know with all the you know implications where we can run you know through blackouts electric blackouts etc just because we've went ahead of ourselves and not managed the transition smooth enough so i think here it's basically getting the balance right into you know how we put the transition guidelines in a way that can accompany if you want both uh, technology and public opinion at the same time um, and uh, you know I, I would be remiss if i don't mention you know um, you know uh, howard will certainly be more eloquent talking about it but in may 2020 the hkma and the securities and futures commission jointly initiated the establishment of a green and sustainable finance cross agency steering committee um, the ECB has itself also, um, you know, done, um, you know, num you know, number of activity, including, you know, a recent uh, climate stress tests, which they conducted um, over a time horizon of 30 years. Um, and both the HKMA and the ECB have been prominent, really, in their leadership, um, the, you know, and, and the examples we set in the space. Uh, and finally, uh, I should mention that the establishment of the Network for Greening the Financial System, NGFS, uh, now has 95 members and um, this has provided a forum for central banks to address climate change and ESG more broadly uh, you know and share experiences and best practice and this is a very welcome development in this space. Well George those are great comments to hear I mean given that HSBC has been around for 156 years you operate in 64 countries, you have a wealth of experience to, to speak from um, and a great perspective. So you obviously see a lot of collaboration happening. And I guess your message is this is important and it needs to continue as there are a lot of common problems and we're trying to find some common solutions. Um, if we take that theme a little bit further about the importance of this collaboration, and then you mentioned especially taxonomy and, and standards, and we look at sort of the benefits of harmonization of some of the efforts that are going on out there. Um, let's turn to an area that's really uh, very dynamic right now. And that is the whole question and area of the innovation and payment and the evolution of the uh, market infrastructure. Because we see that, in fact, a lot of innovations and payment mechanisms are leapfrogging legacy financial infrastructures and newer models that are emerging um, with both the increased use of digital, digital assets and tokenization uh, that we see with the greater interlinking of payment system globally in search for instant and frictionless experience for the user, um, and also the inclusion of, of non-banks. And, and we touched on uh, some of the G20 initiatives, you, Howard, uh, sorry, uh, George mentioned a number of things. Um, so let me go back to Ulrich here and uh, ask you as part of the G20 initiative, um, do you think central banks are considering a concerted effort to interlink payments infrastructures globally? And in this effort, if there is one, how do you see the role of uh, banks and non-banks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Patricia. So, um, yeah, central bank international collaboration in those fields is not uh, new, of course. If you look at uh, the work of um, the Basel committees like the CPMI, uh, formerly CPSS, there was a lot of, or, I mean, you go to the website, you find uh, decades, let's say, of publications. Uh, where central banks, you know, have been sitting together and trying to uh, set uh, standards to work on those topics. And uh, and now, of course, the work uh, on cross-border payments that you mentioned is, uh, is a very important one. And uh, the, let's say, shocking finding, which uh, is a bit the starting point, is that although technology has tremendously evolved, you know, you can have a, a video call with a lot of data transmission between Germany and Pakistan or whatever country for free, the cross-border uh, payment fees have not declined over the last uh, 
two decades um, and uh, you, you you pay you know a horrendous amount if you do a remittance of 200 us dollar you pay at least six percent on average uh, as a charge so this this is uh, astonishing and had to be addressed and therefore this uh, work stream was uh, launched and uh, the approach was really to uh, um, to work on various channels i mean you have mentioned some patricia it's uh, really you know that 19 building blocks in total so it covers both um, cross-border use cases wholesale and retail different uh, channels so both traditional correspondent banking and uh, new products be it uh, stable coins or cbdc and both the front and and the technical um, the back end level including as you mentioned the interlinking of uh, of infrastructures and uh, it also includes and that's that's very important as well as you mentioned um, topics you know including private and public sector the regulatory areas like aml cft uh, regulation and its implementation in a let's say uh, more digestible and efficient way for banks and and other providers to be able to you know rely on good quality data in this field and allow to use it for straight through processing of cross-border payments so one of the reasons for the lack of progress in this field has been the so-called de-risking of banks who have become more prudent in offering those services and uh, and newcomers in this field also being subject to quite some uh, challenges in in this uh, regulatory field so that, that that is a good illustration of the need for collaboration between uh, official and private sector but if you look at the 19 building blocks wherever you zoom into you find uh, tasks uh, both for the public uh, and the private sector and uh, and this is also why the um, the different groups um, including the work streams led by the cpmi i are reaching out constantly to uh, the private sector i'm leading one of the building blocks and we have uh, um, had several events with uh, market participants asking them really what their perspective is how we can help them and the last uh, thing i would like to mention is uh, the report which has already been published for public consultation on the objectives of uh, this agenda so measurable targets in terms of speed in terms of uh, fees and in terms of accessibility of cross-border payments i think that's a big achievement this uh, report which for the first time really tries to quantify targets and set uh, a date for achieving them uh, will be very relevant i think in the future not because we will exactly manage to hit all of those targets but because it gives us for for the first time a measurable reference uh, to see what happens in this field and that is of course also allowing us then to go back to what we have been doing and where we have failed so i'm quite optimistic that over the next uh, say five years a lot of progress will be achieved there that's great um thank you for that ulrich um george you've already spoken a little bit about some of the work that's going on in terms of collaboration and that you're engaged with and, and certainly enhancing cross-border payments is a is a critical part of that so let me let me turn to howard um in addition to payments uh there's a lot of talk about sort of the the financial infrastructure that a 21st century central bank should provide for the digital economy would you like to elaborate on that a bit in terms of what the uh, hong kong monetary authority is thinking no th thank you thank you Pat. And uh, before I move on to the new kind of a digital uh, financial infrastructure, I talk a few words about just the payment infrastructure because uh, payment infrastructure, as we know it, has been there for many years. But when we talk about payment these days, whether domestic payment or cross-border payment, time is of essence and everybody wants to have instant payment. And um, I think in terms of both uh, the infrastructure as well as the uh, policy and also the protocol, uh, perhaps a, a lot of uh, more work uh, would also need to be put into it to make sure that this could happen. Uh, because it's uh, very different in processing a payment 
uh, in batch mode as against in real time mode. Um, everything changes, and um, and uh, things that deem acceptable in terms of timing in the past would no longer be acceptable. But when payments goes that fast, uh, other things kick in like uh, AML, CFA, CFT. How do you do it? Um, financial crime. How do you claw back the money if you see there's a scam going on? So these are things that uh, is not easily resolved, but um, there's continuously increasing public demand for faster payments domestically and also internationally. Uh, so even traditional infrastructure, we need to set upgrade. Now, then I move to um, the digital infrastructure uh, that um, uh, we in the HMA are thinking, which is uh, not just for payment, but for, really for data. Uh, we are doing something called a commercial data interchange. Um, the idea is now is that um, um, very often, no matter whether you are a corporation or an individual, you have a lot of digital footprints uh, scattered around in different platforms. Uh, very often now uh, some big tech company who might have access to a big chunk of these data, they can monetize. Uh, the data on the corporation or an individual for advertising for other purposes or credit assessment. But at the end of the day, uh, you as an individual might not benefit uh, as much uh, to your digital footprint to show your credit worthiness. So what we are trying to do is provide some kind of central bank operated interchange uh, such that we can allow data providers, which are different platforms to plug into it and then financial ins institution as the data user to plug into it. Uh, we operate on a consent basis. So the users, the data subject, uh, would have full autonomy, full autonomy of the sort of the use of the data, whether they allow different providers to plug the information, the data into the platform for use of financial institution of their choice, uh, such that they can obtain uh, a fuller profile of the corporation uh, itself, uh, I, I would call this a more liberalization of one's digital footprint. Uh, this is uh, something that we are um, building and hopefully the first stage will come into operation uh, later this year. This is important for a relatively small but open economy in Hong Kong in the sense that we do not have a dominant sort of a holder of uh, personal information or corporate information uh, such that there's a one-stop shop for financial institution. Uh, so it would be very costly for different financial institutions to tap into the different platforms. So we want to provide a hub and spoke arrangement where everyone can connect very easily on a consent basis. And in, as the central bank at HMA, uh, we are mindful of the privacy concerns. So we are not going to see the data going through. Uh, everything will be encrypted, but we will provide the sort of ins and outs and the consent management system such that everybody can access the information more easily. So I, I think um, there are other infrastructure that we can consider to provide and we are building like identity management, um, digital identity, best is a single log on uh, uh, verification of identity, no matter whether it's for individuals or corporates, these are best done by central bank or government entity. Um, so these are the things that we need to provide in order for the financial sector to really uh, escalate to the next level and use a more data-driven approach of uh, operation. Thank you, Howard. Um, you certainly sound like you're ahead of the curve of, of uh, or certainly keeping pace with the industry uh, and all these challenges coming out. Um, I want to just turn to the other side of technology and innovation in terms of how it's driving fundamental changes uh, and forcing, I think, uh, particular innovations in, in the going back to the payments industry or the payment sector. One criticism of the banking industry has been that it's not been sufficiently inclusive. Um, some estimate that 30% of the world's adult population still do not have access to banking services. And partially in response to this demand um, for easier, faster, more accessible means of payments, uh, we've seen some digital currencies emerge as one solution. Um, so central banks are also considering 
uh, CBDCs in part uh, as a result of declining use of cash, also to improve payments and to respond to private cryptocurrencies. But I think um, the whole question of digital currencies, that is stable coins, crypto, and central bank digital currencies have created very important implications for regulatory frameworks um, that were generally created, obviously, long before the era of digital uh, finance. Um, and in addition, some digital currencies have been criticized as potential threat to national fiat and domestic monetary policy. So I think many of us noticed that uh, ECB President uh, Christine Lagarde said recently that cryptos are not currencies, but speculative assets. So I, I'd like to ask Ulrich, uh, looking at cryptocurrencies, do you think that they can coexist with CBDCs? And particularly, um, how are you looking at um, the work you're doing on a digital Europe in terms of how it uh, will help address some of these payment issues? Um, and you see collaboration again, you, you referred to this, but given all the work going on in the private sector, it seems that collaboration between commercial banks and central banks and some of these other non-banks is particularly important. But um, over to you about crypto and digital currencies and CBDCs. Thanks, Patricia. Lots of uh, topics you touched in one question. Um, I think one has to distinguish in what is called often crypto assets uh, stable coins versus crypto assets in a narrow sense. I think uh, at some stage we wanted to use the term crypto assets only for narrow, I mean, for Bitcoin type of, you know, no uh, no issuer um, products. But then the somehow the practice of uh, language has uh, overtaken us and crypto assets is used for everything, for instance, in the Mika draft uh, regulation. But uh, there's a big difference between the two. I mean, stable coins, you could say, is a sort of um, convertible. I think it, it, it tends more and more to be a convertible form of electronic uh, money that may be, you know, issued via a blockchain or not. Blockchain fans will say this is essential that it's on a blockchain, but uh, others may say this is only an IT question, which is not irrelevant, but which is not at the core of the function. Uh, why, why crypto assets are, are something completely different. I mean, Bitcoin is a construct. Uh, it's a, it's indeed a speculative asset. It is, um, it is, uh, you know, it cannot have a stable value, and it is very um, expensive in being maintained, and it is, it, it, it cannot be efficient. And I think the main proposition that was also now um, brought forward by um, by those who introduced um, Bitcoin as legal tender was uh, cross-border payments. And of course, Bitcoin may be efficient in cross-border payment or may seem to be efficient because it is not uh, yet subject to the same scrutiny as, uh, as other uh, means of payments. And this point I made previously that it is counterintuitive that technology has become so efficient, but cross-border payments have uh, have not is um, you know applicable to efficient infrastructures but less so to bitcoin which as we know uh, relies on a on a very energy consuming mechanism and the fact that it seems competitive in cross border payments is of course uh, just due to regulatory arbitrage and is not sustainable and of course the public sector should look at this and you know close this uh, regulatory arbitrage gap as uh, quickly as possible and then also this illusion of uh, Bitcoin as an efficient way of cross-border payment will, will quickly go away for sure. Um, and I think what uh, central banks have at the end reacted to uh, more is, uh, is stable coins indeed, because there were big techs entering this market with a uh, big, uh, let's say, promises. And uh, also there, I think the, the slowdown of, uh, of the deployment uh, relates to facing uh, regulatory realities, which have been applicable to uh, banks uh, and other service providers for a long time. And the deployment of such a global stablecoin first has to address uh, the regulatory dimension uh, according to the principle of, uh, of one uh, risk, uh, one rule, which should apply uh, for different providers. Um, and that's uh, that. That was, however, the nevertheless, I think the 
main uh, kickoff for the intensification of the work of central banks in this field. And uh, the ECB, for example, has uh, moved uh, now forward quite uh, forcefully in the domain of CBDC. It has, or well, it is launching a project on 1st of October, a two-year investigation phase for a digital euro will uh, start. So we will deploy quite some resources in identifying exactly the use cases, the functional scope of a CBDC. There have been a lot of, um, let's say, ideas um, projected into CBDC. Um, a bit, you know, whatever gap is seen in payments uh, was uh, said to be solvable through CBDC. In theory, you know, this is uh, true, but uh, in practice, uh, we are not able to package everything in one go into CBDC. So um, take the example of cross-border payments. I think, yes, uh, this should be a part of CBDC and, uh, and it will be one further, let's say, competitor in the international space, not crowding out the private sector. But uh, why not also, in, also having CBDC entering this space? But, uh, you know, what, what do we think we can achieve what can we really deploy in a few years' time if we want to be ready in, let's say, five, six years to issue a digital euro? Um, not necessarily everything in one go. No, if we um, are able to deploy uh, POI payments domestically in five years, then we can, I think, congratulate ourselves. While um, we, uh, let's say, other things like programmable payments, offline payments, cross-border payments, international um, interoperability. It, those are all things we should keep in mind now. Be prepared to have them eventually in scope. We will see. But uh, we cannot, I think, load everything and say in five years' time also we will solve uh, cross-border payment issues necessarily with CBDC. It's a bit more of a medium-term objective in my view. Yeah. Uh a lot of issues to address in that. Howard, tell us, um, what is your position with the uh, CBDCs? Oh, um, I very much uh, agree with Ulrich. Um, I would put it that uh, all central banks uh, would need to future-proof themselves uh, for more for wider adoption of uh, CBDC in future. You don't know whether it's three years down the road, five years down the road, or further down the road. Uh, but this is something that no one can can really ignore. That's why uh, we have been working on CBDC uh, for some years, starting from uh, 2017. Our um, uh, starting point is to look at the wholesale use of CBDC. My personal view is that um, given that uh, CBDC, the main difference as to the other form of electronic money that uh, the general public are transacting on is, is a claim on central banks. Uh, so at the retail level, that might not matter too much um, in the normal days, unless there's bank, 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 bank confidence issue. Uh, but um, at wholesale level, and if we have a currency which can have a potential of like a DVP uh, transaction with a digital asset, that probably would create uh, some ground for financial innovation going forward. So. Um, I personally see more scope there, but it doesn't mean that retail CBDC doesn't have a future. It really depends on the idiosyncratic situation of different jurisdiction, the stage of development and the use of uh, cash versus other electronic forms of payment. Uh, that's why we are also working on the retail version of CBDC and some projects we are working uh, together with the BIS Innovation Hub in Hong Kong at both the retail level and wholesale level. Um, but like what uh, uh, Ulrich uh, mentioned, there are a lot of complex issues that need to be looked at. And that's why we need to do it uh, soon uh, to make sure that we uh, fully stretch out the issues. And when the time is right, when the sort of a UK scenario uh, are more uh, uh, are clearer, uh, then we are ready to uh, move forward uh, pretty quickly. I think that's uh, something that we have to do. That's great. 
Um, we're quickly running out of time. I want to just cover one last topic, even if we do it very quickly, and that is the question of uh, collaboration, which we've talked about quite a bit, but also uh, competition between um, banks and um, central banks, the public and the private sector. Uh, some will say if too much innovation comes out of central banks, it'll be crowding out the private sector. Presumably, there's room for both. Uh, there's so much to do out there. Um, let me go back to, to, to George, because uh, certainly in the area of CBDCs, that's, this is a great opportunity. Opportunity, uh, for collaboration. But what's your take, George, in terms of uh, competition versus collaboration between banks and um, central banks, commercial banks and central banks? Thank you, Patricia. It's a very delicate question to answer in this, uh, in this panel. Um, but um, <laughs> I'll be very open and transparent. Um, number one, I think banks today and central banks have common interests, shared interests. Um, and have common targets in terms of what we want to achieve um, within the financial stability and price stability considerations, what we want to achieve for our clients and for the economy at large and the communities we operate in at large. And I think these considerations now are fundamental in the way banks uh, and the conduct in banks um, uh, operate. And, and that, is, that is really the overarching statement I want to I wanna say. Now, there may be areas where we can have differing point of views, and these would be areas for open debate. Now, as a commercial bank, we do understand that obviously the ultimate decision is that of the central bank and the regulator. But nevertheless, where you know we have use cases, we have experience with direct economy, and we feel it is our duty to put these considerations forward for the evaluation uh, by our regulators uh, you know, as they think through the future regulation. I think there are a few areas where we, we, we need to be kind of mindful of um, you know, possible, if you want, challenges that we will face. The first one I, I touched upon it a bit earlier is the fragmentation. It is important and, and central banks have been extremely strong at collaborating between themselves. I mean, we've seen the responses to the COVID crisis, the responses to the you know, global financial crisis back in 2008, 9, 10. The, the level of collaboration, the swap lines, the repo facilities, et cetera, where central banks work together, sometimes despite geopolitical challenges, to get us as quickly as we can um, you know, out of a very difficult situation has been amazing. Um, nevertheless, there may be other areas where we see some fragmentation. The requirement for subsidiarization of our activities as a commercial entity means we end up with um, you know, small fragmented balance sheets, probably individually not able to cater for the challenges of the economy they operate in or of the clients that we work with who are most likely in many cases global in nature. So that is, I would say, one, um, you know, one challenge to keep in mind. There is another challenge which is also worth mentioning, which is what's the interaction between the bank sector and the markets? Um, and what, what we've seen um, recently through the, you know, the COVID crisis is that if regulations in some areas become too restrictive, it is likely that it prevents banks from acting as a buffer in the time of crisis. And, and, and then therefore requiring, if you want, central banks to immediately step in and act as the buffer of last resort in some, you know, many cases, the credit of last resort. But as we've seen also in this crisis, the credit provider of last resort on the bank government. So it's about finding the right balance where bank, banks can still do their role of buffering um, any shocks before, if you want, the public purse or the taxpayer has to step in and support. Um, but there are a number of areas where we're certainly cooperating very actively. The sustainable finance, um, you know, the regulation and, you know, that are taking place in sustainable finance, the definition of tran transition pathways, um, you know, how can they be achieved? Acknowledging that there will be different transition pathways for different economies, but how can we work towards those as an area of great collaboration? And obviously CBDC is a great example of collaboration where um, it's in the interest of, of all to have a faster, uh, cheaper, you know, cost-effective and, and safe payment mechanism uh, you know, for, um, you know, for, for uh, you know, our currencies. Um, and I think the, the efforts led by um, the central banks to promote this, um, you know, we've particularly been working with, the, for instance, the Banque de France, 
on the issuance of an OAT in a tokenized form settled um, with the e euro, a CBDC euro, if you want, again on a tokenized form, all on a permissioned blockchain. In the test case, in the test case environment, the sandbox environment, is, is an amazing kind of case in point and how you know commercial banks and central banks can work together to further the technology of tomorrow. Um, I'll finish on the note uh, that um, you know both Ulrich and Howard somewhat touched on, which is decentralized finance is a reality. It's happening out there. We as a regulated entity have no intention to be operating in a totally unregulated space. Therefore, we do call, obviously, our central bank and our regulators to consider ensuring that, um, if you want, these stable coins and other kind of crypto are regulated commensurate to the risk they pose. And these are both systemic risk, prudential risk, consumer protection risk, as well as financial crime risk, you know, illicit financing or sanctions risk, uh, you know, know your customer considerations. And therefore, I, I do think we can't ignore the fact that it's happening out there, totally outside, if you want, our regulated space, and that somewhat consumers are attracted to it, but somewhat we need to protect consumers and, and make sure that we have the right regulatory framework that uh, you know, underpin that activity. George, thank you very much. I think that's actually a great wrap up of uh, just about everything we've been talking about. I would wanted to do a quick go round on sort of what do you think the big issues are from everybody uh, today and what might they be 10 years out? But I think we've actually covered them and they're very many. Um, and we may not have a crystal ball for 10 years out, much less the end of the century, uh, where we still have 79 years to go in terms of what will a central bank look like. But I think it's very clear that there are very complicated and numerous challenges facing central banks today. But what I'm hearing from um, the panel is that there are uh, mandates which allow for addressing them. There's a lot of really critical work that's underway. I think all of you would agree that collaboration is absolutely critical having the input of the commercial banking sector who's on the ground, um, but having the, uh, the oversight role of the central banks who are watching everything going on on the ground and making the two come together is absolutely uh, essential. So um, just want to thank everybody very much for t their discussion today, for your participation. It's a, it's a very interesting discussion. I think one thing we know is that uh, this is not, uh, not going to be resolved and uh, overnight. Uh, it's very much a work in progress, but we look forward to continuing this dialogue. So stay tuned for more on this topic. Thank you very much.